Hello, and welcome to part two of our series, Kaskaskia and the Pursuit of a More Perfect Union. I'm Gabrielle Lyon, Executive Director of Illinois Humanities. Uh, Illinois Humanities is a nonprofit organization and our state's affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our whole mission is about activating the humanities through free public programs like this one, grants that we make to organizations throughout the state, and educational opportunities, which all together foster reflection, spark conversation, and strengthen the civic fabric of our state. I'm joining you today, however, from the National Humanities Conference in Los Angeles, California, and it does feel like a fitting place to kick off this evening's programs and the important questions at the heart of it. Kaskaskia's incorporation into the newly established United States is really just one of many historic events of significance. The village was very first established by Kaskaskia Indians and French colonists at the confluence of the Kaskaskia and Mississippi rivers in what is present day southwestern Illinois, but the village was established back in 1703. Since then, many groups of people with sometimes very different ideas about politics and society have called that place home. And for all of these reasons, Kaskaskia's three century history gives us really special food for thought as we consider what the pursuit of a more perfect union actually involves. I'm very grateful to the National Endowment for the Humanities for providing support for this program as part of its A More Perfect Union initiative. And I really want to thank everyone who contributed to part one of this series. And I'm so excited for you to meet all of the participants in part two. And now let's continue to explore Kaskaskia and the pursuit of a more perfect union. Complex, variable, multi-layered. Adjectives describing the history of Kaskaskia. As we discussed in part one, Native Americans of the Illinois Confederacy and French colonists who had begun to form a distinctive interracial Catholic community founded the village in 1703. They cooperatively built it into a thriving center of trade and agriculture, the breadbasket of French America. After the French and Indian War, the British assumed control. On the second anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, Colonel Clark and Virginia militiamen claimed Kaskaskia for the incipient United States without armed resistance. The bell that King Louis XV of France had given the village rang to announce the occasion, becoming known as the Liberty Bell of the West. Kaskaskia joined the Northwest Territory in 1787 and received an influx of Anglo-Americans. It became the capital of the Illinois Territory in 1809 then Illinois' state capital from 1818 to 1820. Under pressure from the federal government, the Kaskaskia tribe, whose population had declined, officially relinquished almost all of its land in Illinois and migrated west in 1833. It persists today as a sub-tribe of the Peoria Tribe of Indians of Oklahoma, which is working to sustain the tribe's language and traditions for posterity. Kaskaskia remained a commercial hub in the mid-19th century, benefiting from the steamboat trade, but harvesting of timber to fuel steamboats hastened its downfall. As a result of erosion caused largely by deforestation, the Mississippi veered toward the town. In 1881, it changed course, flowing into the channel previously occupied by the last few miles of the Kaskaskia River. Now situated on an island, the town disintegrated as the Mississippi's current gouged away the land beneath it. Residents moved the church and the old courthouse to the center of the island, establishing New Kaskaskia. Despite challenges, the community persevered throughout the 20th century. Now accessible only by way of Missouri, it persists as one of Illinois' smallest yet most historic municipalities, thanks to the dedication of its residents. Kaskaskia's history encompasses multiple groups of people and many different social and political formations. Therefore, considering what the concept of a more perfect union might have meant to various Kaskaskia residents at various times, as well as the ways in which they've pursued it, might offer lessons that we can apply as we seek to achieve or sustain a more perfect union within our own communities, state, and nation. One component of life in Kaskaskia until the 1840s was slavery. In the community's formative years, 
members of the Illinois Confederacy tribes sometimes captured and enslaved members of other tribes. By the 1720s, Kaskaskia residents had begun using the labor of enslaved black people. According to some accounts, a prominent landowner imported several hundred enslaved Africans in 1724, but more recent scholarship indicates that the number was much smaller, on the order of 10 to 25. In any case, by the 1750s, enslaved black people comprised a third or more of Kaskaskia's population. Some had been intended to work in mining, and some might have been sent to labor in lead and silver mines across the Mississippi in present-day Missouri, but most worked in agriculture, especially the wheat farming that accounted for much of Kaskaskia's prosperity. Although the French Code Noir seems to have prevented some of the physical cruelty that people enslaved in many other places suffered, slavery in Kaskaskia, like slavery anywhere, was intrinsically unjust and inhumane. The Northwest Ordinance, and later the Illinois Constitution, officially outlawed slavery in most circumstances, but people who had practiced slavery under the French regime were allowed to continue. Additionally, some of the Anglo-Americans who migrated to Kaskaskia and its vicinity from the southeast in the early 19th century also practiced slavery, exploiting lax enforcement or legal loopholes, such as Illinois' indentured servitude policy, which allowed terms of indenture exceeding a typical human lifespan. Although slavery certainly wasn't as prevalent in Illinois as it was in the adjacent states of Missouri and Kentucky, it was considerably more common than Illinois' status as an officially free state might imply. Attitudes toward slavery among white residents of Randolph County, of which Kaskaskia was the county seat, varied widely. Some Randolph Countyans strongly supported slavery, others actively opposed it. In the latter category were members of a particular branch of Reformed Presbyterianism known as Covenanters who lived in or near Sparta and Eden. Many of these Covenanters were of Scots-Irish ethnicity and had migrated from upcountry South Carolina. Culturally, they resembled their fellow upland southern migrants to southern Illinois, but differed from many of them in that they vehemently opposed slavery in keeping with the tenets of their faith. Consequently, northeastern Randolph County became a site of anti-slavery and racial justice activity. As a result, significant numbers of African Americans moved to the area, beginning in the first half of the 19th century. Evidence suggests that some of them likely were people who had been enslaved in historically French communities such as Kaskaskia or their descendants. Today, the Sparta area remains the place within Randolph County with the largest concentration of African Americans. We invited two regional filmmakers to produce a segment of this program examining current African-American life in and around Sparta. Although they've been working diligently on that segment, circumstances unfortunately prevented them from completing it for inclusion in this production. But we eagerly look forward to sharing it on the Illinois Humanities YouTube channel soon. The Randolph Society, founded in 2017, recognizes Randolph Countyans who made valuable contributions to humanity, locally or beyond. Randolph Society honorees Nance Leggins Costley and John Willis Menard were African Americans from Kaskaskia whose accomplishments had a statewide and national impact. They were nominated by literary scholar and cultural historian Lauren Kena, a member of the Society's Board of Directors. Nance Leggins was born in Kaskaskia in 1813. Her parents were indentured servants, uh, essentially enslaved people in all but name, who lived in the household of a man named Thomas Cox. He ran a boarding house in Kaskaskia that actually was the place where the Territorial Assembly was meeting at the time. As the state capital then moved, she moved along with it, with the Cox family, so first to Vandalia and then to Springfield. But ultimately, when Thomas Cox fell on hard times, his creditors came after his entire estate which included the people that he had indentured or enslaved. In 1827, Nance and her sister were sold in the only recorded public slave auction in the state of Illinois' history in Springfield. But for Nance, she always had questions about the status of her freedom. She was really interested in trying to figure out if there were ways that she could reclaim the free status that she felt she held rightfully. Um, so she looked to the court system to help her. In 1841, a young lawyer named Abraham Lincoln took her case. 
and, and argued it before the state Supreme Court in Springfield and successfully helped to prove that Nance was indeed a free person. Uh, it's really important not only because of what it did for Nance and her family's legacy, uh, but it also helped to set important precedents for people seeking freedom in the state of Illinois. The system was complex, I think, for a reason. It was confusing for a reason. And people like Nance really helped to start clarify the legal issues behind the institution. She's one of my favorite figures to come out of Kaskaskia because you know that she paid such close attention to the topics of discussion that were swirling around her day after day. She really absorbed a lot of those lessons and she had such courage to use them to help not only establish her own life of freedom, but a life of freedom for people who came after her as well. John Willis Menard was born in Kaskaskia in the 1830s. He was part of a family that included parents who were free people of color. He may have been a descendant of the French-Canadian Menard family who settled in Kaskaskia in the 1790s. He's probably most famous for the fact that he was the first African-American person who was elected to the United States Congress. Uh, after he grew up in Kaskaskia, he was educated in Sparta at the abolitionist schools there, and then went on to become a renowned writer and speaker, worked in the Lincoln administration, and then in 1868 was elected to Congress from the second district in Louisiana. But unfortunately, as a sign of the times, he was denied his seat in Congress after his white opponent contested the election. He went and made a famous speech in front of the chamber of House of Representatives in Washington, becoming the first African-American person to do that. But ultimately, the legislators decided to deny him his seat, and it was largely because of his race at the time. One of the things that John Willis Menard was hired to do by the Secretary of the Interior during the Lincoln administration was research the possibility of forming new colonial settlements for freed people who had formerly been enslaved in America. John Willis Menard was instrumental in researching the possibility of a colony in Belize, for example, in 1863. Um, and he and Frederick Douglass really had differences of opinion about whether or not that was going to be a positive solution for emancipated people going forward after the Civil War. He was also a really talented poet uh, and newspaper publisher, and I think that some of the writings that he has left behind give us such an interesting picture of what life was like for him and for his communities at that period of time. I grew up in Randolph County in Steelville and was educated here until I went to college. And I'm also someone who loves history and loves to read about history. And I encountered the story of John Willis Menard just by chance through my reading. And I was so surprised that I had never heard that the first black person elected to the United States Congress was from the same place that I was from. So it's been an important part of our commitment and our charter with the Randolph Society to really tell diverse stories from Randolph County in terms of ethnicity and gender and geographical location, fields of expertise. I think one of the most important things about having people like John Willis Menard and Nance Leggins Costley in the Randolph Society is that it allows us to shed light on sort of an alternative history from Kaskaskia that maybe isn't told as often. And it, it provides us with a, a story that really enriches and clarifies what was happening in Kaskaskia. Kaskaskia was a complicated place. It's a fascinating microcosm of what America was like during this period of time. Um, and it's not just the story of the powerful men who were able to run businesses and, and seek government positions. It was the stories of all of the men and women who helped the entire community function. One of our big missions with the Randolph Society is telling stories about the past as a way to inspire people in the present to do great things in the future. And one of the things I've really loved learning through work with the Randolph Society is that great things happen at home and great people do interesting and important and impactful things right here as well. Among the Randolph Countyans who are currently working to make impactful things happen at home, 
are those who sustain and promote the county's French Creole heritage, increasingly affirming the indigenous cultural influences that it reflects. On Kaskaskia Island, Immaculate Conception Church perpetuates the community's French heritage as well as the legacy of its Native American founders. The parish traces its origins to a Jesuit mission established in the 1670s at the Grand Village of the Illinois, located along the Upper Illinois River. In the 1690s, residents of the Grand Village, including members of the Kaskaskia tribe, began a series of migrations southwestward, culminating in the founding of Kaskaskia. The building we're in now is probably about the fifth building for this congregation. So we, we always say the congregation started 1675, but we wore out several buildings. 1838 is when, by this time, we had people coming from all over because it was after the Revolutionary War and after the Louisiana Purchase, and, and we had uh, stonemasons come in and bricklaying, brick makers, so they went to building the brick church on it. Now, however, the, in, the things inside remained, and so the old hand-carved wooden altar behind me dates to those earliest churches here, which would have been at least before 1714. The oldest baptismal fountain is the one over here, and it would date into the 1700s. A more recent addition to the church's furnishings is a tanned hide robe adorning a statue of Mary, sometimes called Our Lady of Kaskaskia. The robe was made and donated by Native American scholars and artists John and Ella White from Western Illinois and features imagery representing both indigenous and Catholic spiritualities in recognition of the congregation's native roots. Another institution raising awareness of the French colonial legacy in Randolph and nearby counties is the Kaskaskia Cahokia Trail Foundation, named for a road that connected Kaskaskia with another village founded by members of Illinois Confederacy tribes and French colonists 50 miles north. The organization's website, maps, and signage contextualize and interpret relevant landmarks and historic sites. Its comprehensive brochure, published with support from an Illinois Humanities Forgotten Illinois 200 grant, includes a greeting from the Peoria tribe of Oklahoma. Another grantee partner of Illinois Humanities is Les Amis du Fort de Chartres, the Friends of Fort de Chartres, which aims to foster a symbiotic relationship between cultural sustainability and economic opportunity. Fort de Chartres was established 17 miles up the Mississippi from Kaskaskia in 1720. It served as a colonial military and governmental headquarters, administering Kaskaskia and other villages in the French-occupied Illinois country. They built three wooden forts first before they built the fort that you see before us, which is made out of a stone, a limestone from the surrounding area. But there was several French villages in the area. There was Prairie de Rocher, St. Philippe, and the village of Chartres. And each one of those villages had surrounding farmland. Farm was the main um, economic development for the area. Uh, they farmed in fields which were called um, long lots. They were measured in arpents. And those long lots behind us stretch all the way from Fort de Chart to the limestone bluffs. And those are actually still laid out in the same way today if you were to look at an aerial view. And a lot of them are actually even still farmed by the same families that they were farmed almost 300 years ago. Right down the road was a Michigamia tribe. They had a village, right? And they, they were very close with the French. I'm wearing kind of a French and Native American mix. Um, 300 years ago when Fort de Chartres was here, there was not a lot of women other than Native American. So a lot of the French soldiers intermarried to the Native American women and we call that a Matisse. Les Amis de Fort de Chartres sponsors all the events here at Fort de Chartres. We do all the tourism promotion as well as uh, the education program. We also help with interpretation on the site and we also raise funds for things such as repair projects for the site. We have some demonstrators during our events that do anything from basket ma making, um, pottery, we have a bake oven demonstrations, 
Um, we have bow making, we have blacksmithing, um, just about anything that you can imagine we will have demonstrators doing during the events, as well as uh, for education program, we we'll try to do classes or demonstrations throughout the year, um, and then we offer those classes to the public to try to teach and, and encourage more people to get involved in those life ways. A lot of this stuff was imported by France 300 years ago. They found it in archaeological digs. So those are the type of things that we try to uh, replicate as artisans. We try to involve the local village of Prairie de Rocher to try to develop some artisan pathways, um, teach 18th century avenues of how people lived then and how they can use those avenues to try to, to establish economic development growth in the area today. I have not seen very many people locally with any of these um, avenues. They all kind of have developed to where they're working in the cities and doing other things. You know, even back 50 years ago when the rendezvous started, there was a lot more people that did uh, the very fine things that, that even came out and did reenactments and demonstrations and things like that. So we are trying to really recreate that to get more people interested, but we're also creating the avenues for them to be able to sell their wares, to demonstrate their wares. Uh, we've developed the Heart, of an, the Heart of Illinois Country Heritage Shop, which is a uh, website where we can ask artisans to actually sell their wares. You can teach them how to make a basket, but if you're not developing a life way for them within that, they're just gonna be a hobbyist at it. They're not gonna make a career out of it or a life way out of it. So we're trying to do all parts involved. People are talking about it now. As to where when we started, you know, five, six years ago, they were not because there's the lack of funding with the state of Illinois with the site. So we've really stepped up since 2015 and, and fully funded the events. They're all ran by volunteers. And I think that that says a lot for our volunteers and for our organization that Fort Deschart hasn't skipped much of a beat uh, over the past couple of years because we've been able to step in through the help of sponsors and our volunteers and keep things going. Well, first of all, I'd like to say bonjour. Welcome to the Fort de Chart Jardin Potage. This would have been the uh, job of the woman of the house. It would have been her duty to take care of this garden, to raise enough f uh, food to feed the family for a year, and to then sell any remaining like to the fort or to any other uh, villagers or passerbys uh, or travelers to the area. This garden is um, an example of a t kind of French heritage garden that travels all the way from uh, Canada, from Quebec, through Montreal, and as the French moved across the continent, they brought this gardening style with them. It is actually a garden of the 17th century style with raised beds with, where everything is grown together, vegetables, fruits, herbs, surrounded by an orchard with uh, beds for larger crops beyond, in this case a melon and squash and corn bed beyond and then the whole thing would have had a chicken coop and shed and everything and the house would have been included in stockade fencing similar to what you can still see today down in St. Genevieve. Um, this garden uh, is approximately the, the average lot size of a heritage garden was about a quarter to a half acre and um, this garden is just about as big as what they would have had. What you see here are Around the, the perimeter of the, the garden are espaliered 18th century variety apple trees um, and there are wild grapes um, on the other side which are what they were documented as making wine from and selling of the period. Everything in this garden has been researched as best it can be but it's a fascinating journey to take to look at their food ways and see how some of these handed down recipes where they come from and to see their French roots or sometimes native roots. So they encourage intermarriages, it helped build native alliances and it, um, it helped uh, solidify these uh, different villages and, and the fort population. This whole environment was really one of give and take. They understood that they needed that native knowledge about what grew here, what, what, what would uh, how to, how to uh, 
the, the growing seasons and the weather, and it helped them acclimate much more quickly than a typical colonist to North America. This is called a Maycock squash, which was a native squash that um, was shown what, what the natives might have been growing. And we combine it with, these are dried scallop squashes that were just came out of the garden last week um, that we grow here as well that is typical of a European, something the Europeans might have, have grown. This is an example of a, a long red uh, pepper and it's a cayenne type. They'd string them up over their hearth or near their hearth to dry and they would um, take the seeds and make uh, uh, powder of them and use that to season their food. Kind of the beginnings of Creole, uh, you get into Creole flavoring. So I do an annual seed swap where um, it's now going on its fourth or fifth year and where I allow, uh, I, I put out for free seeds from and invite everyone from the community and beyond to come and share seeds they have and or to share seeds of the garden. I'll have local residents uh, area wide come to me and say uh, a couple of things. Usually it's, you know, I found my, I have these handed down recipes, but they don't make any sense to me. They had their booklets, which only usually mentioned the things that uh, were unusual about that recipe. So that those common things that you'd normally see, like mix this, or they assumed you knew that, you know, and I can often help them figure out how it was made. They grew up here locally or regionally, and they had some of these elements of this garden that they grew up with helping their grandmothers with, and they, when they would ask why it was done a certain way, like why would you have raised beds, why would you, and they, and they were just told because that's the way you do it, I, they, they appreciate understanding their culture more and understanding why they were built this way. There's a, a bread recipe handed down called the Prairie de Rocher bread, and I usually make it when we're here at the, at the bake oven, and I had a Girl Scout troop of local Prairie de Rocher, so some of, the, some of them are descendants of the people who made this bread, and I have them help, the, help me make it and show them how, to, how they would have made it in the 18th century, and that's a really neat connection. Prairie de Rocher, population 500, observed its 300th anniversary in 2022. The celebration coincided with renewed interest in local French history and folkways. In 1974, much of the community and its vicinity joined the National Register of Historic Places as the French Colonial Historic District. Now, regional leaders hope to attain national park status for sites including the architecturally significant Creole House in Prairie de Rocher, the Pierre Menard Home, and portions of Fort Kaskaskia State Historic Site, which encompasses remnants of two fortifications that were smaller than Fort de Chartres but offered more immediate protection for Kaskaskia residents, as well as the historic Garrison Hill Cemetery. Senators Tammy Duckworth and Dick Durbin and Representative Mike Bost have introduced legislation to establish the Prairie de Rocher French Colonial National Historical Park. In addition to historic preservation, cultural sustainability, and tourism promotion, one impetus for pursuing a national park designation is the prospect of assistance in maintaining the levee that protects the Prairie de Rocher area from the fate that befell Kaskaskia in 1881. We're hoping this time next year that becomes a reality. If it does, it actually opens the door to some federal funding, uh, hopefully for the preservation of the area to do levy improvements, which uh, we're in great need of. Basically, after Katrina hit in the Gulf, uh, there was a lot of levy failures down south, and the Corps went in and did some evaluations and drew up, between the Corps and FEMA, they drew up some new um, criteria for levy certifications and we became decertified not long after that. Um, when, when you get decertified, you're officially in the floodplain. It raises your insurance rates. Uh, it's been about 10 to 20 percent on an annual basis. So yeah, we've got a lot of challenges that we face. And when I say costly, we're talking a hundred million um, and, you know, we just don't have the taxing body for that kind of funding.
Although local stakeholders and public officials hold a variety of opinions as to the best course of action regarding the levy, they generally agree that the status quo can't be sustained indefinitely. They hope that designation as a national historical park would make resources for maintaining the levy more accessible. They also hope that it would generate beneficial publicity and foster perpetuation of local historical memory and traditions, much as it has in nearby St. Genevieve, Missouri. Among the keepers of such memories and traditions are Betty Jean and Dave Dwaron. Mr. Dwaron is a descendant of several long-established French families in the Prairie de Rocher area, where, as in Kaskaskia, the Catholic Church, St. Joseph's in this case, is a major cultural institution. The church was, it would, it could dominate at least five or six different periods of the year. Uh, it could, First Communion was a big thing. Uh, when I grade, when I was in the first grade, there was, Prairie de Rocher, there was 40 kids in the First Communion. And when you had, when you had that kind of a thing, there was 50 or 100 people that showed up just for that little kid's family re first communion. And that, that was, but the church itself, you had, and we we're going to have a picnic here in, in a couple of weeks uh, at, the, at the Catholic church. And the, the church picnic was a big thing. And the, all the different seasonal things, Easter and, and confirmation. And it was, it was much now, we went to church Sunday and uh, this huge, beautiful church, Prairie de Rocher. Uh, maybe you've been in, maybe you haven't. But it's, it's, uh, there was maybe 80 people in there. Maybe, maybe a 90, I don't know. But there used to be, when I was a kid, you had to go early to church to get a seat. They liked the fiddle. They liked, of course, my dad, he played the banjo. And then uh, my uncle played the guitar. And, but there was my other cousin, Gene, he, he played the fiddle all the time. And he was, they all could play. If you came here to visit, my grandmother lived in a log house right over here where I was born. Uh, there was always music come from across the road. <laughs> always. Make any difference when you came. <laughs> Usually every house had a, farm, had a garden. Oh, yes. And my grandmother had one over here in the yard over here. She had uh, basically the star normal things and potatoes and green beans and, and beets, whatever. Of course, they had onions. Onions was a big thing. They would have raised beds, and then between the beds, then you would have like a very smooth path yes, yes, that they that's used. Yes, that's a French tradition. Yeah, yeah. she had that. One of their favorite foods was the chicken bouillon. And that was that was a big thing. It was mainly family. And uh, they would, uh, he, he, my grandfather, Fred, really liked it. He just really, let's have, let's have a bouillon, he'd say. The specialty of chicken soup was that you made it thin made it then <laughs> well they'd, they'd have 20 20 people and have one rooster <laughs> so in regards to what they wanted it was then <laughs> but they put onion in it and so forth it was good there was also a pretty big element of fish of uh, river fish and so forth that uh, they would have because the river as the river uh, changed uh, there would be bar pits that had fish in them, and they would go out and sane the fish, and they would have big fish fries. Well, my my original family is Bevenu family, and they came here in 1719 to New Orleans and migrated up to Kaskaskia. Well, I was born about five miles from here in a house. There was no hospitals at that time, and... Um, uh, my parents formed, and uh, then they moved to St. Louis and abruptly moved back because they lost everything up there in a store. And my dad became a road commissioner at that time. Then I married and married Roger Menard, who is a distant uh, 
relative of Pierre Renard. He is, actually he is the tenth generation of Pierre. Yeah, a lot of the um, pastries, particularly Madeleines, I think Madeleines they're called. Uh, that was a very, very prominent thing in our household, and that was French. But although my mother was not French, she was German. But uh, she carried on to the French as much as she could. Well, we had andouille, which is uh, the French meat, and we had boudin, which is the blood sausage. We had that always. We butchered uh, all of our meat and everything and, all, and killed all the chickens and things like that at home. Um, my dad helped put up hay and they, well, I still own the house and the barn that my parents owned then and my grandfather built, which was built in about 1900. And um, that's still, it's still standing. Music, I'm, I'm just wondering if, uh, uh, if in, in addition to La Guillaume, uh, if, if you recall any, any um, French songs being sung or French tunes being played? The only ones that I know would be the ones that we use at the at the Guillaume Ball, and, uh, and we, we use those always. <laughs> Lagione is a song sung by the peasants that made a better life possible for the landowners. And so it's a begging song. Let's see, I'm going to be 80. I think I was young, young when I was about seven or eight years old. We're carrying on a tradition that's been going on almost 300 years. It wasn't a religion, but it was something that was dear to our parents. It was dear to our parents, that's what it was. And it was like a fulfillment of New Year's Eve. Um, My grandfather led the Lagione. And at that time, there was num a number of La Guiones. There was, uh, this was the, you might say, the hollow La Guiones. And they, there was the families were Robert and uh, Roy's and Bevenu's. And they were all French. They were sort of related to a number of them. And, but they were all French people. And they, it was a, it was a big thing for them, New Year's Eve. Basically, what it, is is it's a it's a troubadour song that came from France, and in our history books we have uh, a a uh, writing of those troubadours that went to the rich people's house and asked for food and it, on, on the holidays. Scholar Anna Servius writes: La Guiani is a ceremonial rite that belongs to a category of celebrations situated in the carnival calendar between All Saints' Day and Easter. In North America, urban and rural versions appear in various Francophone communities from the Caribbean to Canada. Thus, La Guiani is related to traditions such as rural Mardi Gras in Louisiana. In both, as Servius notes, performers travel to houses where they receive portions of food as payment for their performance, as nourishment for the impoverished of the community, or as provisions for a banquet at a ball. Currently, however, Prairie de Rocher and St. Genevieve are the only places where La Guiani specifically still occurs annually. Servius comments, being a creative expression of the identity of the communities of St. Genevieve and Prairie de Rocher, La Guiani transforms the space and the community from everyday life to a life between history and the present. I'm English and German, but we always went to listen to them sing the La Guiana. And I knew, you know, pretty much about their singing. I listened to it since I was a little girl because my mom and dad voice wanted to hear it sung. So I, I've, I never dreamed I was going to learn it and to sing it. And I'm really happy about it. <laughs> When I came back then to Prairie Rocher in 85, uh, a lot of the people around town and so forth wanted me to go with them. The fiddle player was already 80, Bill Clare, and he said, somebody's going to have to start playing the fiddle. Well, I'd never played the fiddle at 50 years old. And so I started picking it up. 
and eventually I got to where I could play the lagioni on the fiddle. <laughs> It's not near what it used to be because the younger generation does not no. participate. And also, the older generation that felt it so significant are gone. So that's, the, that's a big change there. We have one girl that plays the fiddle with us, and she says she'll never change. Sarah Wigard, she will always play the fiddle in the Lagione. And she's pretty young. She's only about 30, what, 38. So she will, but hopefully she'll carry. Jerry on. Franklin is very loyal, uh, and I'm. I tell Jerry I'll do whatever he, he whatever he wants to do. I'll I'll go along with him, and so we're gonna. I I can sing it myself. I can lead it, uh, and Jerry, Jerry is very loyal to it. He's and he, Jerry is is a good, smart person in these in this field, and so. But he is getting up there too, and it's, if Jerry doesn't, then I'm not sure we'll be doing it. I went to the church school for about five years, and to the fourth grade. I taught these kids, it took about eight weeks, and they could sing it. There was some of them really good. Uh, they could they could repeat it very well, all 17 verses. But then that's where it ended. As a matter of fact, for I'm not sure about this coming year, uh, whether we'll really have a band or not, because we're still looking for one. Well, as a kid, coming down here with my dad, it was, it was quite inspiring as a kid. That's something we're very proud of. You know, I'm not the only person that's nerding out about this. Like, everybody tonight was just because they want it, they want this, they want this tradition to be maintained. There's a benediction that actually happens at the end in which you, uh, uh, the Capitan, or whoever, the guy carrying the biggest stick, as they're going house to house, they're tracking mud, they're knocking things over, and it's his job to get everybody out of the house. And, uh, and so he says, Nous on garde la compagnie, à demande pour nous excuser. At the end, so we're asking everybody, we please excuse us. Yeah, we're going to leave you alone at this point. That's Illinois Humanities Rhodes Scholar Dennis Stromat. When he was growing up in southeastern Illinois, family visits to nearby Vincennes, Indiana, piqued his interest in French American culture. He pursued that interest as a history student at Southeast Missouri State University, often visiting old mines a rural community in the Ozarks about 50 miles west of Kaskaskia and Prairie de Rocher, where French traditional storytelling and music making thrived. Today, Dennis is one of the few professional musicians and scholars specializing in French Creole musical traditions of Middle America, as distinct from those of Canada and Louisiana, and one of the few who can demonstrate similarities and differences among them. Many songs, though, we have in relationship to other areas. There are songs that we do that are in relation. Now, may, they may be, they're done a different way, but um, for example, Chevalier de la Tabaron, that is a song that, that exact name in Canada, that the Quebecois and French Canadians use it. Uh, they have a tendency to play the song. Je le vais y être 
If you go to Louisiana, they have a song that they call La Table Ronde, or the Round Table. And of course, the Chevalier de la Table Ronde is about the Arthurian tale for the uh, search for the Holy Grail. In Louisiana, they call it the Table Ronde. And it's the same thing. It's a search for a grail or for a cup. And this is a song that comes at New Year's, uh, usually done six days after New Year's around that time. And, uh, but they do it like this. Now, when we do it here, and I learned this actually from a couple brothers in uh, Cahokia, Illinois in the mid-90s, um, the, the Ducharme family uh, from Cahokia, and they would sing the song like this, but it's more similar to Canadian style, um, but still not the exact same way, much faster. Yeah. Dennis will return shortly to close out our program. First, though, let's take a moment to contemplate what the themes that we've discussed might indicate about the pursuit of a more perfect union. Kaskaskia's multi-layered history involving multiple groups of people and many different social and political configurations. Kaskaskia's persistence as one of Illinois' smallest yet most historic municipalities, despite its being accessible only by way of Missouri, thanks to the dedication of its residents. The Peoria tribe's remarkable cultural sustainability initiatives in Oklahoma, as well as growing recognition of the Kaskaskia tribe's legacy here in Illinois. The progress in race relations that has occurred in southwestern Illinois since the 19th century, as well as the racial discrimination that still too often occurs. Challenges involving flood control and essential infrastructure that Prairie de Rocher, Kaskaskia, and many other small communities confront. Both the durability and the vulnerability of community-based traditions ranging from gardening to Laguiani in the face of technological and economic change. The creative efforts of local people and organizations to promote virtuous cycles in which cultural conservation generates economic opportunity and economic opportunity incentivizes cultural conservation. All of these matters are complex and challenging, and their social and civic implications are subject to interpretation. For that very reason, they give us much on which to reflect as we consider how best to relate to our communities, state, and nation, as well as the natural environment and one another. We at Illinois Humanities thank the many people who've participated in the making of this series, whether on camera or behind the scenes. We're grateful to the National Endowment for the Humanities for its support through its A More Perfect Union initiative and to our friends at Baldwin Media in El Dorado. And we're especially grateful to you for joining us. We wish you a peaceful and meaningful holiday season.
That's all there is.